My name is Mickey Barker. Today is July 21, 2015, and I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee to interview Jerry Summers. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Mr. Summers, will you give us your full name, please? My full name is Gerald Howard Summers. I'm known as Jerry. The Gerald came from part of my mother's name, Millie Geraldine Keeble Summers, and my other half was Homer Howard Summers, my father. You and I have known each other about 50 years, haven't we? At least. Is it okay if I just call you Jerry throughout this interview? I would prefer that, Mr. Justice. <laughs> well, well, give us your birth date, if you would, please. May 28, 1941, three months older than you. And was that here in Chattanooga? Ca Old Campbell's Clinic in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Well, my wife had her appendix out at that hospital in 1963. My mother called me every year on my birthday to remind me what she was doing at about 10.30 on May the 28th, 1941. And what was your mother's full name, just for the record, as they Millie say? Millie Geraldine Keeble Summers. Was she a Chattanooga native? She was from a big community called Rock Springs, Georgia, right over the city line and uh, over the county line, state line. I hate to ask you these tough questions. Do you know her birth date? Uh, it's September the 24th, September the 24th, and my dad was 1917, she was 1921. And your father's full name? Homer Howard Summers. And where was he from originally? He's over from Henry County. He Over. graduated from Henry County High School over near Paris. And how did your father and your mother meet, her being from North Georgia and him from Upper West Tennessee? My father graduated from Henry County in 1935, and he went to Nashville, got a job with the Martin Oil Company, who ran spur stations, and he up and operated that one there, and they liked the way he worked, like everybody there knew my dad. Um, and he got promoted. They were open station here, which is at the old Chattanooga Choo Choo, which is now the Carter Barn Garage, but they had a service station there. And one of the employees that worked under him was my mother's brother, Thurman Keeble, or Short, yeah. and he introduced uh, my dad to my mom, and they got married. All right. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have one brother, John Summers, who is 11 years younger than me, he lives in Nashville, and is uh, is uh, more active involved in politics than I am, but he's served in several capacities, yeah. and he has three daughters in, in Nashville. Is he a lawyer also? He does have a degree. Uh, he grad got a degree kind of late in life. Uh, he uh, got graduated from the Nashville School of Law, but he has never really practiced as, as a practicing yeah. attorney. And where did you go to, to elementary school? I went the first two grades at Red Bank Elementary, a suburb of Chattanooga. And then we had moved to Florida because of uh, health problems at that time. Chattanooga, as you well know, was heavily industrialized and smog filled. And my dad had a histoplasmosis from working in chicken uh, coops over in West Tennessee. And they told him he had to get out of this environment. So we went down to St. Petersburg, Florida. And I went from there, to started school, went through the ninth grade until we came back up here for other reasons. And I, my dad, um, I came back one half a year in the fifth grade and went to school at Red Bank, but then went back to Florida. And why did you, well, tell me a little more about your dad and the chicken coops. Well, he, he contacted histoplasmosis, and it was a lung disease, and that got him declared 4F in World War II. He tried to enlist in the Navy, and they turned him down. And so he had these problems that were developing in his lungs. So he worked for the Railroad Express at this time. He had left the Martin Oil Company and went to the Railroad Express, which is the old FedEx, right. uh, equivalent of FedEx on the railroad. And uh, we had to go down to St. Petersburg, and St. Petersburg at that time was a six-month-a-year town, and Daddy was low on the seniority list. So in the summertime, he would get laid off and work in Orange Groves, and he drove a soft drink truck called KIST Kiss Beverage. And then oh, I remember that. When, when I was 11 years old, my mother was in the hospital having given birth to my brother, and my dad was in another hospital, Mountain Park. She was in St. Anthony's having two-thirds of his stomach taken out because he had ulcers. Mm. And who looked after you? There was a gentleman that worked with my mother at a place called Temple Groves. They had a distributorship down downtown St. Pete that sold oranges and grapefruit. And a gentleman named Curly Kennedy. And he would lived in North Carolina, but would come during the winter to work down there. 
and we took him in as a boarder. And be very honest with you, with dad in one hospital and mother in the other, uh, Curly Kennedy is uh, was was very important in yeah. keeping keeping our family going. And you moved back to Chattanooga when? I was in the ninth grade at Northeast High School, one of the new high schools that had been created, and things got pretty tough financially for my family, and they had to come back to, to get a better employment. And they left me down there for six weeks, and I stayed with another family because I was on the baseball team, and we were going to the state tournament. And so I lived with another family for six months, six weeks. And Daddy got off at 11 o'clock one night, got into our luxurious 1941 Buick in 1955, and drove all the way down on the old Highway 41, right. uh, got in about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We loaded up my car, I drove, and my motor scooter. Uh, they, somehow they would bought me a motor scooter, I don't know how they paid for it. But anyway, I drove all the way back. We had a little garage apartment out in East Ridge, another suburb of Chattanooga, and uh, I went to bed about... Uh, Six o'clock after mother, seven o'clock after mother cooked me breakfast, and that's when I got to Chattanooga. And you said something about playing baseball in the state tournament. Were you in the ninth grade then? Ninth grade, we played against Key West, and we didn't last very long against Key West. They had great teams, still do. Yeah. And when you got back to Chattanooga, where did did you go to school that fall here in Chattanooga? I went to Chattanooga Central. My uh, uh, mother had called me and wanted to know where did I want to go to high school, and I said, well taking great thought about academics and so forth, I said, well, who's got the best sports team? <laughs> and, uh, of course, that was Chattanooga Central back in yeah. the heydays of the Red Edder and Stan Farmer and so forth era. And uh, so the funny part about when I got in from St. Pete, when I went to sleep, mother comes in there and wakes me up. She says, son, there's a gentleman out here to, to meet you. Well, that was Coach Stan Farmer. And he was the official recruiter for Central High School, which certainly wouldn't happen today, I don't believe. But uh, he welcomed me to Chattanooga and said, we're, we've got an American Legion team here, and we understand you're not a bad baseball player. And so they got me the first day, and I went and worked out with the Central Pennies, which was sponsored by Bill Penny Tire Company, and we played in shorts. Did you ever, did you ever know how Coach Farmer got your name when you just gotten in from St. Petersburg the night before? Well, I think that Mother had dropped the word to some about it in the community, and Coach Farmer had a great recruiting system that he he always on the lookout for somebody that might have some talent to move in. Now, Rossville, right across the state line, had another recruiting program. They got a lot of great ball players because they would give uh, the f parents of, of a ball player a job at the old Peerless Woolen Mill. But yeah. Coach Farmer was his personality was Central's recruiting program. And what position did you play on the baseball team? I was a catcher. Had you played catcher when you were in Florida? I was a catcher from the eighth grade up until uh, I went to Auburn. Uh, I got a baseball scholarship, partial baseball scholarship to Auburn, and I didn't want to catch anymore. The tools of ignorance had been worn too long, and I tried to play third base, but I, I finally, eventually, when I transferred from there up to Swanee, uh, I played shortstop and second base up until about the last two weeks of the season and our catcher got hurt and Coach Shirley Major said, what are we going to do? I was co-captain of the team. He says, what, what are we going to do for a catcher? And I <clears throat> kind of embarrassed him. He said, well, Coach, I've done this before. So he said, let me see. And he said, well, I believe you have done that before. So I demonstrated to him. And I said, well, he said, you're going to be our catcher from now on. And so I told him to, if he would let me make a call home to get my dad to bring my mitt, because my dad was working from Railway Express and was driving a tractor trailer between Chattanooga and Huntsville, Alabama, and he would go through Swanee. Let me back up just a little bit. You, Coach Farmer recruited you for American Legion Baseball, then you went to Central High, and he was also the, the football line coach, wasn't he? That's correct. And did you play football too? I did. And I don't want to embarrass you, but in 1959, you were the starting quarterback for the Central High Purple Pounders. That's correct. And you were five feet, nine inches tall. I've shrunk a little bit. <laughs> All right, now, now you, you, you offered a baseball scholarship at, at uh, Auburn, and you took it, you say. Well, and what, what discouraged you about Auburn? Well, I, I was promised a scholarship to UT to play baseball, but somehow that fell through. And Coach Farmer talked to a fellow by the name of Dr. Oogie Martin, right. who's, who's the head of the Auburn Alumni Association, and he was going to get a scholarship for a, a pitcher who I ended his high school career by the name Norman Bazanka. And Norman played for Notre Dame, and both of them were Catholic. 
And so Coach Farmer, I found out later, went to Oogie and said, if you're going to help Norman, would you help Jerry? So me and Norman wound up being roommates at Auburn, got our tuition and our books and a job in the old Auburn Grill next to Toomer's Corner where they, the Alabama fans uh, destroyed the trees. Uh, that Dr. Oogie Martin was a veterinarian here in town. That's correct. And you've given him, in your book, uh, the first book, you've given him a lot of credit for helping you through the years. Did you do anything else besides help you get in Auburn? Well, help me get some dogs, <laughs> and uh, he, he and he was a wonderful man. Yeah. Oogie Martin was a little man with a big heart. And so you spent one year at Auburn, and you decided that wasn't for you. And how did you wind up at the University of the South at well, Swanee? There was a sporting goods salesman at uh, Lookout Sporting Goods in Chattanooga called Sammy Joyce, yeah. who happened to be a roommate with Mickey Mantle, which is an interesting story in itself. Uh, and I wasn't very happy, and I played ball that summer, and I got to know Sammy, and he, his account was up at Swanee, one of his accounts, and he was good friends with Coach Shirley Majors, Johnny Majors' t uh, right. father, and he was also the baseball coach. And I didn't, I told my, my shoulder, I'd had my shoulder operated on twice, and I, I didn't want to play football, but they talked to the basketball coach, who was Lon Varnell, and they said, well, if you can pass the test academically, we'll get you a academic scholarship, which the only reason I got it is because I played basketball and baseball. Uh, I think the time is statutes run on Swanee being charged with illegal recruiting, but basically, you know, normally it's the reverse route. You go to Swanee and then you flunk out and you go to Auburn or, or transfer. But I, they took me and I passed the test and I had three wonderful years up there. Well, let's back up a little bit again. Uh, at some point, I think it was as you were graduating from Central High School, weren't you Drafted by the New York Mets as they were a young team in the major leagues then? No, I was I was offered a, uh, offered a contract with the Mets when I graduated from Swanee. Swanee, okay. Yeah. And why'd you turn it down? $500 wasn't real attractive at that time, <laughs> and that was all they offered me. $500 signing bonus or per month well, or they, what? Well, uh, they didn't really say. They said, we're over here to scout this uh, kid from Washington, St. Louis, but you're, you made the all-tournament team, and I have the authority, one of the umpires, to sign, and if you'd like to, we'll let you go play minor league baseball. But fortunately, at that time, I got a scholarship to UT Law School. Uh, is that 500 a month or 500 a year or 500 one time? <laughs> They, we never got to a bonus, but they said it'd be $500. And I thought, well, maybe I can do a little better than that going to law school. Well, why did you decide to go to law school? Had there been any other lawyers in your family? Nope. How'd you wind up deciding to go to law school? I felt a lawyer by the name of John K. Morgan, who you know and I know is an outstanding member here and a uh, member of the bar and a great lawyer. Uh, my uncle who was a wonderful fellow, but kind of indulged in certain activities some people not approve of, such as gambling, uh, represented, uh, was represented by John K. Morgan, and he wanted me to go talk to him. I'd been offered this scholarship to UT. I'd been offered this contract. Um, I was thinking about going in the Air Force as a pilot, and that was during uh, Vietnam, and that probably wasn't a very good decision. And I'd been offered a job with volunteer life insurance at $500. The people at Volunteer were all Swanee graduates, and my uncle took me down to talk to John Morgan, and John Morgan, very persuasive individual, he immediately eliminated all of them. He said, well, the volunteer life, you're not going to go very high because there's about 10 in-laws ahead of you, so you're not going to get to be the president there. I didn't think I could play baseball because I had my shoulder operated on, and I, I just didn't think I could get around on fastball. And, uh, of course, the decision about being a pilot in Vietnam was not very wise. And John eliminated all those. And I thought, well, I got this scholarship. I'll go try it. And How so did I you took, get a scholarship to UT? Mainly because of the strength of the University of the South's reputation. I was not a great student at Swanee. I had several jobs and mm -hmm. played sports. When you got to UT, did you like it immediately, or did it take you a while to get used to it? Well, I didn't have a scholarship the second year. I'll leave it put it to you that way. I didn't do very well, and but I think John Morgan and some other people helped me, though, say and pull the mule out of the ditch and straighten me out. I didn't do well. Law school is different. You have to think differently than in undergraduate school. But I did pull it out and uh, fortunately did graduate. Who are some of your close friends in law school that we may still know? Well, let me, that's, that's, that's one I wasn't prepared to answer. I'm trying to think there were people, Bob Eccles, federal district judge, Buck Ramsey, who's now deceased, was the district attorney, Gus Wood, Adolph, Gustus Stolfus Wood, who uh, was the uh, 
commissioner of safety and when he was flying around in a helicopter. <laughs> uh, those are three of the most illustrious and there's others that, that, yeah. that were there. We were not, uh, they all turned out better than probably I have. When, what year did you graduate from law school? 1966. I, I went straight through. I didn't, it took me three years, but I didn't miss, I took four quarters every year. I didn't went all the way through. So three years nonstop. Nonstop. No, no summer breaks. No summer breaks. And when you got out of law school, did you have any job offers waiting you? Well, I think that I always tell the story when I'm asked about young lawyers that I always, that I was in the uh, two percent of the class, the two percent that held up the other ninety-eight percent, because I worked three jobs while I was in law school. So you're I, in the top ninety-seven percent of the class. No, I was in the bottom, bottom ninety-seven percent of the class, <laughs> and uh, I worked in different jobs, different things, liquor stores, investigators for Sid Gilreath in, in Knoxville, and various things. Worked at a bellman at a motel and all those sort of things, and uh, I didn't go to class a whole lot, but I I got through, but. Uh, I, my uncle was involved in politics in Chattanooga, yep. and as Chattanooga, uh, the candidate for district attorney was Ed Davis. And my uncle at that time was engaged in the uh, disbursement of certain non-taxable spirits in the community, and he was well thought of. And he helped <laughs> my uncle, helped Ed Davis roll the vote, as we call it, in the controlled wards. And out of that, uh, that means getting people to the to the uh, to the polls and voting a certain way. And what do you mean in controlled wards? That, that well, that would be where there would be somebody that would be head of the ward, and he was kind of the leader. And they, the folks in that precinct would probably would follow him. And they sometimes they would get a bonus if they would go in uh, into the precinct and vote a certain way. Then when they came out, they would be invited to have a, a, a sample of some probably non-taxable liquor. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ed Davis won. And Ed he, Davis, the, our district attorney district, general? He was district attorney general. And he up and uh, asked my uncle uh, anything he could do for him. And he said, I've got this nephew up and coming out of law school, and would you consider interviewing him? And he did, and whatever, however the interview went, I got the job. And when did you start? I started uh, 19, uh, September 1, 1960. Nine, I believe. Sixty-six. Sixty-six. You're right. So, what was your first day on the job like? I was I was supposed to be an assistant backing up another assistant, uh, John Curtis, and I thought John Curtis was the greatest trial lawyer I'd ever seen. I was with him for about six months, but I learned out that he didn't ever try anything unless it was a slam dunk. He didn't try any tough cases, but uh, he quit after six months or four months, and I was given the job of handling one of the divisions in criminal court by myself, four months out of law school, actually, and that was wow. quite a learning experience. For young lawyers who are graduating from law school, would you recommend that they get a job, if they can, as a, a prosecutor? I think it's great experience, uh, either there or the public defender's office. I, if you could get both of them, uh, I think th th having that wealth of experience has helped make me a better lawyer, I know. How many cases do you think you prosecuted as, as the lead prosecutor at the Hamilton County District Attorney General's office? Well, unfortunately, my heart has been more with the defendants than it has been in the prosecution side. I only stayed 28 months, and there was a reason for that. I, you know, I asked one of my professors in law school, a very fine, renowned historical professor named Forrest Lacey, and he used to be a prosecutor in Indiana. And I said, why did you quit being a prosecutor? Because he taught contracts in law school. He said, well, it just kind of got to me a little. He said, just kind of. You've been interrupted by a fire engine. I, well, I've been interrupted by a lot of tougher situations. But anyway, <laughs> he said, I asked him, well, why, why did you quit being a prosecutor and teaching contracts? He said, I just got tired of going to court with a hangover trying drunks. <laughs> And so that carried a little bit of significance. My heart, I've always been more for the underdog than I am uh, the non-underdog. When, when you left the DA's office, what did you do? I went to work with uh, Arvin Rango and Joe DiRiggio, the and, odd couple, I call them. And Joe DiRiggio, for those maybe un, may not know, later became a criminal court judge here in Hamilton County, and Arvin Rango was the a city court judge out at the city of East Ridge. And there at was that time they were both practicing attorneys. They, but what happened is uh, 
uh, Joe DiRiggio's partner, Ralph Kelly, had become mayor of the city of Chattanooga, and he and Arvin were good friends. And uh, uh, Joe, I think, had the number one or number two highest grades in the history of Vanderbilt Law School. And Arvin's family came off of the west side. His, his father uh, ran a grocery store the west side of Chattanooga. And, but they were both very successful lawyers. Uh, Joe was deceased. I was honored to be a pallbearer at his death. Uh, Arvin is still practicing. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's a unique person. Both of them are very successful with different methods. Joe was the most organized guy I've ever knew. Arvin is the most disorganized, but they were both successful. When, uh, let me ask you a question about the salaries you were getting then. When you began as an assistant district attorney general for Ed Davis, do you remember what your, your starting salary was? $9,500. And then, payable then, in then, monthly or bi monthly? Uh, no, well, that's yearly. And it, within, then within four months, I got a raise to $11,500. But bear in mind, people were going to work for law firms for $300 a month. And if you were order the court for uh -huh. so forth, a law review editor, you might get $500 a month. So I, I got, got a Remember, good job. I came back from the Army in September 1969, and I started 600 a month. Let me ask you what, what your salary was when you started with Joe DiRizio. Well, uh, it, I did, it, well, it wasn't a salary. They guaranteed me $500 a month, and then I could keep, uh, the deal was that I could keep the next $1,000 if I made a 1000 I'd get half of $1,000, and then above that I got to keep it. Everything. So I and I I hit city court and I hit sessions court and there was people that my, through my uncle and other folks I did all right. Joe and Arvin never had to pay me a salary, but I didn't didn't ever help them very much. And finally we came to an amicable parting of the ways. And Joe says you got more business than we do, which was not true, but it, I just didn't have the time to work on it. And they were, Joe's a wonderful guy and Arvin's still a wonderful fellow. And how long were you with them before you stepped out on your own? I believe it was about uh, 28 months. And where did you where did you go on your on your beginning practice? On I take that soil? back. It wasn't that long. It was probably less than two years. And then you went out on your own. I went out on my own. Uh, I uh, went in an office in a building known as the Professional Building, which is now a park. It is right next to the Memorial Auditorium in Chattanooga, right off of Macaulay Avenue. And I was fortunate enough to get a. a, a spot that people were signed up for, they couldn't take it, and I got an office for $250 a month, including mm -hmm. utilities. And I hired Jan Eason, who's, uh, who had been a secretary for Arvin until she took a maternity leave, and she came to work for me at 12 o'clock each day, and uh, we had a machine, and I'd go to city court in the morning, and sessions court, and Jan would be there, and she was a wonderful woman. She up and she, she consoled me when I lost, and she congratulated me when I won, but said, don't get a big head, because you're going to get beat again. And she was right. What's the most interesting case you think you've ever tried in your career? Not whether you won or lost, but the most interesting case. Well, I've been fortunate in that category, Mickey. I've had a lot of interesting cases. I've represented people that you know, James Earl Ray, I, I represented uh, uh, Joseph Paul Franklin, uh, and I thought about that, no, thinking he was going to ask me that question, and because I was appointed to represent them, and I point out. But I tried a case in guy an ex-policeman by the name of Leonard Griffey, and he had killed his wife and her new lover uh, in her, her new lover's place of business. She was his secretary, and we tried it, and I lost it, and I got the death penalty. And I raised the question that the Tennessee rule of insanity, the old McNaughton rule, was outdated and should be changed. And that was at the time we had the new great Supreme Court with Joe Henry, Bill Harbison, J Justice Cooper, and Ray Brock, and B Bill Phones. And that's about all I had on appeal, because this was a pretty vicious murder. But what happened is they adopted, they, they reversed it and sent it back. And, and just on that issue, on that issue, and to change the the rule to the ALI uh, penal code uh, standard of insanity, and I had to try the case again, and the jury acquitted him. <laughs> and I think that probably I I don't know if anybody other lawyers had that situation, but to me that taught me a lot about the practice of law. That I tried it, lost it, and got the death penalty. Fortunately, got it reversed, and then got an acquittal in the matter. It points out to me you better have some good issue for appeal, even though you think you got a great case. You mentioned earlier that you represented 
John Franklin, John Paul Joseph Franklin. Paul Franklin. He was the guy that blew up the Jewish synagogue out here, B'nai B'rith, and he was very anti-Semitic, killed a lot of people, shot Larry Flint, the editor of Hustler, and also um, Vernon Jordan, the head of the Urban League, traveled around the country killing people, and he particularly liked to kill people that were mixed uh, couples. He took, he picked on uh, if an, if an African-American man was with a, with a uh, Caucasian woman, uh, that's, the, that's the targets he normally picked. And did you go to trial representing him or on appeal? I, along with Hugh Moore of your firm, we were appointed. And a lot of these people, famous people, I, I, was called, I got to know them because of appointment. But we tried the case, and it's a very interesting situation. Uh, this guy was very anti-Semitic. And later, what really chills you is that we were doing pretty well, and the case was pretty weak, and we we're getting getting ready to close, and Franklin wants to up and make a statement, and we object, and he confesses. Well, then I had to make the closing argument, which was a little bit of difficulty, and, and he did get convicted. Got a bunch of years to add on what he already had. But I ran into the foreman of the, grand, foreman of the jury in the, in the airport in Atlanta one time, he came up and spoke to me and he said, Jerry, I'm so-and-so, and we I was forming that jury, and he said, you know, until that fool stood up, we were probably going to turn him loose. Mm. Mm. So that was my experience with Joseph Paul Franklin. And what about James Earl Ray? You mentioned him. He's James Earl Ray, the Honorable Herschel Franks. Uh, James Earl Ray is, is the... For those who may not know who's again, he, who is James Earl Ray? He's, he is who shot Martin Luther King in Memphis. And James Earl Ray, uh, he uh, he was he filed a lawsuit against his lawyers here in Chattanooga that they wouldn't turn over his files. He had several files or lawyers. He had Percy Foreman to begin with. He had a bunch of uh, right wing lawyers representing him, and he filed a lawsuit against a lawyer here who who had helped him on appeal uh, named Bob. Uh, Bob Hill, Robert oh, Hill, oh. and he wouldn't claim and they wouldn't turn their file back over to him. And so I got got the I was appointed by Chancellor Herschel Franks, who served with distinction on the Court of Appeals, and uh, we got the file. And I met with I was going to go with James C. James Earl Ray, and I got the file back, got it recovered, and that was basically all he wanted. And I went into the prison and went in there and and sat down and told him who I was. And I brought this file over there and. And he just looked at it, and I said, "Mr. Ray, there's something wrong. You know, you know, have I done something?" He said, "No." He said, "This is the first time I've ever won anything in a court of law." And so, <laughs> I gave him his file, and that's my extent of James Earl Ray. And I got a lot of notes and stuff that I got in the course of that. How did you get appointed? I mean, did you get a phone call from the judge, a letter, or an order, or what? Well, I wonder, often wonder if my good friend Herschel Franks did it to help me or to hurt me. But but he made that decision. He 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 filed it pro se in Chancery Court, and Herschel Franks was the chancellor at that time. At that time, as I recall, we didn't have any state public defender in Chattanooga. No, we did not. And and so how would how would the judges go about appointing people to represent criminal defendants? Well, unlike today where the courtrooms are cluttered with lawyers trying to get appointments, there was only four or five lawyers that took appointments. Now, normally there wasn't lawyers appointed in civil cases, and this was a civil case in Chantry Court, but Herschel Franks, for some reason, decided he's going to appoint me, and I thought, well, heck, it's a chance to meet a historical figure, and um, so I took it, and it, it, was a, it wasn't very complex. We, I got with the other lawyer that was representing. He had sued the, one of their lawyers, uh, his previous lawyers, and we worked it out. We had this big, long release, and I, I got it. A side point is that there was a lawyer that hang, hung around city court, and he saw me one day, and he said, the day I was going over, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to see James. Well, can I ride with you? And I said, well, yeah, come on. And I said, now, before we get over there, this was about a week or two after the Soledad brothers had escaped out in, in California and killed some guards and Angela Davis. And I said, now, before we go in there, I want you to understand, I'm going to make certain they search us so we don't have no problem if he escapes. Well, he said, I'm glad you told me that. So he pulls out a 25 automatic and puts it up on the dash of, of, my, of my vehicle. And I said, oh, my goodness. But that's a true story. James Earl Ray was at Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. He was in Nashville at the Tombs at that time. I, 
I was going to ask you what's it like, what was it like in Brushy Mountain, but maybe you don't know. Well, the tombs was pretty dark. Of course, they use it to make movies now, I think, in Nashville. What, what, what do you mean, the tombs? That's what they called it. Uh, the Nashville State Penitentiary, yes. River Bend, or what? No, it wasn't River Bend. It was, it, it's the old prison, and they often use it as a movie set now. Okay. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is your civil practice. You've had some pretty good plaintiffs, personal injury and death cases and malpractice cases. How did that practice begin or develop? Do you remember? While in law school, I had the privilege of working for Sid Gilreath as a kind of a uh, investigator. And I was always, and he was active in the old Atla and NACA and so forth. And I got involved in that and I've always had an interest and I've kind of had the benefit of having both civil and and criminal practice. I don't do much civil more because I've got five great lawyers that, that handle it and uh, have had good lawyers all along and been associated with. And, I, but, and I've always enjoyed the criminal side because with all due respect, I don't like to take what I call from the womb to the tomb deposition. That's the, when, you, when these uh, lawyers on the other side will take the case and they start from when you're born to when you die because they're on billable hours and I understand that. And I just don't have much patience. But uh, I've been lucky. I, you know, we don't advertise. That's something I don't believe in. I advertise in every case I have, but I don't mean as far as telling how great I am in these big verdicts and so forth. And we've been lucky. We've had several good verdicts, but we we just don't advertise. You mentioned don't advertise. I saw in the Chattanooga Times Free Press about ten days ago a letter to the editor you'd written about lawyer advertising. Tell us a little more about what you what your views are about lawyer advertising. It is, I was told when 1978, when the first decision came out by the United States Supreme Court that uh, Bates allowed the Arizona. Uh, it, it was uh, Bates and Shapiro. Yeah. And I was told by an old judge, the old trial lawyer, he says, this will be the beginning of the death of the reputation of the legal profession. And I, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. Uh, We've got lawyers that are spending big parts, of, big amounts of money to get cases. They're not qualified. Some of them are. Uh, the problem that bothers me now is it's just getting worse and worse. And you can buy your reputation. I, the ABA Journal had an article about there are now 1,200 best of this that you can buy on your way on to. I, I've been lucky to be in some associations of American College of Trial Lawyers. I never paid a penny for it. And I got voted in by my peers and my opponents. And that's the way it's supposed to be. But now it's all about the money. It, I think it's the biggest cancer on the image of the legal profession that's come down the road. Let's see. You, you, uh, you have been in a number, in leadership positions, in a number of legal organizations. American College of Trial Lawyers, American BOTA. Uh, now it's called the Tennessee and American Association for Justice. Uh, uh, why have you been active in so many of these professional organizations? Doesn't that take a lot of time away from your practice? It does, but we've got enough enemies, the legal, particularly plaintiff's lawyers or criminal defense lawyers. Nobody likes us until they need you. And uh, I think most people, once they get to know their lawyer, but you know, you, it, it's, I've always worked along with, I've been more involved in the trial lawyers, although I've been privileged to be president of the Chattanooga Bar Association. And I don't think there should be the big, any schism between those organizations. They should work together for the benefit of the public. And uh, I've, I've been active in both. Uh, it, it's, but we've, this whole situation since 1978 is, has just turned, it's, it's too much money oriented. People tell me every day, you know, how they feel about these horrible, uh, I, I wrote that letter to, to talking about a ghoulish lawyer advertising. We've had a, an accident out here, a tractor trailer uh, killed several people. The first lawsuit I think was filed yesterday, which, yep. uh, but basically it, we got two law firms here. One has an ad up showing them uh, over the highway with a speed gun uh, and tractor trailers going by soliciting their business. The other is these two that claim they're the insiders and they up and uh, they start billboards, show them on top of tractor trailers. Well, I wrote that and, I, and they said, well, we had those already lined up. And, I, and that we did it because of these lawyers coming in from other states and so forth. And I said, and we did it for the benefit of the, uh, I forget what they say, but I, I told them, and my answer very simply was, is if you didn't have enough respect for the deceased, this was three or four days after these people were killed. You know, it, it, you pull the ads, 
you know, and, and you know, it may cost you a little bit of money, but you know, that shows no respect to me, the, the decedents and their family that are going through this horrible trying experience. And all that does is just deteriorate further the image of, of the trial lawyers. And there's some great trial lawyers. And you know, and, and there, there can be advertising. I advertise every day when I have a case, but I don't pay for it. And there's some ads that are decent. Whoever you are, and you tell, you know, I'm so-and-so, and I do this. But when you start this deceptive, and uh, it's not been regulated, if you put up, well, I got a, we got a million dollars. Well, that case may have been worth five million dollars. And there's all kinds of answers. That each story that these people do that they put on television, you can shoot a hole in it. You know, the insiders that they have. They weren't the insiders. A fellow that's a lawyer named John McMahon, who worked for an insurance firm, started that. And he unfortunately has, has uh, pancreatic cancer. And he sold out. But they took the name, and neither one of them ever worked for And And a clever guy who on the radio, who was a client of mine, came up with the idea he's the insider because he knows what the insurance companies know because he's worked for them. Uh, every gimmick that's used. I've seen people come up, uh, you, uh, do the crazy stuff that, uh, that everybody thinks is funny, but unfortunately, people go for it. You know, Laura's channel, cable TV is full of ads of people that they don't ever, t the little down, script down below, they don't tell you the real truth. And we've got, we've got enough good lawyers in Chattanooga that you don't have to hire somebody from Los Angeles and so forth to represent you. Let me ask you this. how. You began your practice, what, 49 years ago, 1966? 1966. And here we are in 2015. Has the law and the practice of law gotten better over the years, in your view, or worse? There's too many lawyers. There's not enough business. The legislature has taken a lot away the stuff that I do. Uh, lawyers who are having to take cases they're not really qualified to take because of economic necessity. Uh, the legislature is very anti-lawyer, and that's been produced a great deal by this advertising. Anytime they, someone wants to pass an anti-personal uh, injury or tort bill, they will up and they will up and use these horrible advert advertisements and so forth. And it's just difficult. And young lawyers coming in now, I I would hate to start now because it's we've got way too many lawyers, and it's just too competitive. You say way too many lawyers. What can be done about it? Uh, not what Shakespeare said. Let's kill up first thing. Let's kill all the lawyers. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's just not a level of playing field. Uh, people want to be lawyers, and you know I'm proud to be a lawyer. I mean I don't care what you you call me anything you want to, but as long as I'm proud to be a lawyer, I'm going going to do it. And lawyers, you know, I, we've got a case here right now. A horrible case that uh, I was approached on, and for one of the first times I turned one down, not because of me, but we, we've we've had a young man that went off the deep end, and this is in, uh, in you know this year, and and you know I turned it down for the first time, but but and I, and I had had some hesitancy because my lawyers wanted me to, they didn't want me to be involved in it, but I've. I've always believed that everybody's entitled to be represented. That's why we have a presumption of innocence, not a presumption of guilt. And, and I thought about that, and I was a little hesitant, but I was also about to lose my right, my right arm, which the lawyer helps me on all cases because he's a young mother. And the fact is that, that this, uh, this case, this young man uh, killed these, these uh, recruiting fellows here, and, and um, it caused concerns, and I backed off. But I. I really believe in the principle that everybody's entitled to be represented. Now, whether every lawyer has to take every case, no. There's many fine lawyers that handle civil cases that get up, get uh, lose their lunch if they handle a criminal case. Before we began this interview earlier, you said that you had argued two cases before the United States Supreme Court. Let's take a minute and talk about those. Tell me about the first one. Well, it was Brooks versus Tennessee, and it was a case that dealt with the right of the when the defendant had to testify. And Tennessee had a statute, and there was one other one other uh, state that said that if the defendant was to testify in a criminal case, he had to be the first witness. And uh, I raised that question, lost the case. You know, you don't get to the appellate courts unless you lose when you're defense counsel. <laughs> and I've been to a lot of appellate courts, and basically, uh, was that an appointed case or rehired? I was appointed. So you took that case from the Chattanooga Hamilton County Criminal Court to the United States Supreme Court as an appointed counsel? I did. 
and and I it was a great experience. I was uh, to get up there, and I gosh, I think I'm totally incompetent to handle this. But the first question, and I believe it was Justice Potter Stewart, the uh, I'd lost it all the way up, which you normally do until you get to the U.S. Supreme Court if you get lucky. And uh, the lawyer for the other side of the state, a very fine gentleman, said that he was proud to be here on behalf of the state of Tennessee to defend this statute that had been on our books since such and such. And the, I remember Justice Potter Stewart said, well, Mr. So-and-so, if it's not, uh, if it's such a great statute, why is it only Tennessee and one other state have this kind of statute? I felt then I had a chance to win. <laughs> and I had lost all the way through the Court of Criminal Appeals. Of course, Judge Cardin, a great individual, our criminal judge, had overruled me, of course, the Court of Criminal Appeals, the Tennessee Supreme Court. And uh, first time I got a vote, I, it was nine to nothing. But all those, I'd lost every vote. How did you prepare for that argument? You'd never been there before? How did you do that? To be very honest with you, Mickey, the the way that things are done up there now, I'd be scared to take a case up there. I, even though I'm trying to get one up there as a, maybe the final act in in my career, uh, but you just you know you just know the facts, and they were much more genteel and courteous than they are now. Now it's just uh, you know you can't even get your mouth open until they they attack, attack, and it's just it's just everything's five to four, and uh, it was it was uh, everything's just different. And what was about the second case? Second case was a the retroactivity of a case called Waller v. Florida, uh, which dealt with uh, and and that case I I didn't I did not argue that case I was going to but I I had two cases in the same year and I thought well you know this is going to be like going city court I'll be back up here every year and so <laughs> forth and Jim Robinson asked me to take the case and I I handled it all the way through the lawyer late, Jim Robinson late, he's deceased was yeah. primarily an insurance defense right. lawyer malpractice lawyer and he asked me to do it and and I was going to argue the case and I said Jim you know you do it you you probably won't get to come back up here I said I'm I look like I'm gonna be a pretty regular well I haven't been back to argue since then but but uh, Did you know Jim win that case Jim won it and what were the issues it, the retroactivity of Waller versus Florida about in out of st. Petersburg case over out of st. Petersburg Florida where I lived and where your daddy died okay I remember when you built your building after you moved out of the, the professional building, you built a building here in Chattanooga to practice. And I remember when I went to, this was back in the early 70s, I remember going in there and I'd never seen a law office that had a kitchen and a shower. Did you live down there pretty much working? No, but I thought I, I spent a lot of time down there. I worked five and a half days a week and sometimes on Sundays, and I figured I'd, you know, it'd be appropriate to have a kitchen. Well, with the kitchen, at that time, that area, uh, we didn't have all these restaurants. And that time, my secretary had a little bit, well, actually, across the street was a house of ill repute. And right next door to the left of it was another house of ill repute. And it wasn't the best neighborhood, and I built it, uh, and I thought it'd be comfortable, and it was. I, well, you had a reputation for showing up to work at 4 in the morning and leaving at 11, 12 at night. Yeah, that's, Is that that's true? False. That's false. I just gave that impression. I, I was a workaholic, and it's, I still try to give it, but I don't work <laughs> that hard. I, I, I did work long hours, and I always worked on, on, on Saturdays, mainly to accommodate people that worked. And I got criticized by one of these uh, uh, AVO or something things about a client that I had them come in on Saturday. And I thought, well, I come to work on Saturday to 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 accommodate people who had work during the week. But this person was offended by it. So, one of the practices areas of practice we haven't talked about is your labor law practice. How did that develop? And tell us a little about it. I'm trying to remember, but we got involved. I tell you, how it happened. I, I, all the labor unions were represented by a fellow named Del, the late Del Houston, and he had been a young lawyer hired by the lawyer named H.G.B. K. King. H.G.B. E. King had all the labor unions. He took Dell in, and Dell was getting kind of old. And I, well, the machinists came to me, and they said I represented a couple of their members, and they said we'd like you to take over. Dell's getting kind of old, and I said no, I'm not going to do that to an older lawyer. It's been widely respected. So I offered Dell a place in my office up there on 50 Lindsay. I let him have his office downstairs, didn't charge him anything. And then when he died, it, I got all that business of all the labor unions. And I've, it was one of the, I think, one of the best things I ever did. I, I treated him with respect. He was entitled to, even though 
He was a rough, rough old cigar chewing, looked like he hadn't shaved in two days type guy and would take a drink of whiskey. But uh, as a result, I got the opportunity to represent most of the unions in the Chattanooga Labor Council on the building trade. Do you still have a, a labor union practice? Yes. Jimmy Rogers is, I pretty well delegated a lot of things. Jimmy Rogers is my uh, lawyer in the, uh, Jimmy Rogers Jr. And he represents the building trades and the labor. And he, he does a good job and I still, let them know I'm there if they need me, but uh, it's, they've been good to us. Back in the, uh, I guess it was 1970, the legislature passed the, the first Tennessee plan, it wasn't called that then, and I think at one point you were on the Judicial Nominating Commission as it was then known. Tell us a little about that. Well, I was appointed by uh, Governor McWhorter, as I recall, having been a lifelong Democrat, now a distinct minority in the state. <laughs> uh, but I was on there, and I served as vice chairman and also as chairman. And uh, remember what years that would have been? Approximately. Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember when Judge, uh, Governor McWhorter was there. But uh, we had some tough issues there. We had the Lanier matter that came up, or and um, I think that the, I don't know about these commissions now. I certainly wouldn't judge them, and I, and I know they've got to make some decisions here. Have been making decisions, but that was. Uh, a, a big honor, and I felt like that we tried to do what was best to pick the best judges. I don't want to rehash old history, but for those who may not know, that was Judge David Lanier from over in West Tennessee, I think somewhere around Ridgely. Well, tell us a little about how the Judicial Nominating Commission was involved in his case. Well, his family was... His Dyersburg, I'm sorry. Dyersburg, yes. His family was, was very strong politically in Dyer County. And I think that in return, working for Governor McWhorter, they had Sometimes it happens that you maybe get a little preference in some appointment, and his name, uh, we were getting ready to make this appointment to the Court of Court of Appeals from the Western Section, and the rumors had started talking about some of the indiscretions that he had with some clients that ultimately led to him to being going to a federal penitentiary and uh, being a fugitive, actually, yep. and now. But um, the Governor McWhorter, I understand, I think, had because of the support they had, said that he would be given due consideration, uh, political consideration. And that was kind of a, with these rumors flowing around, uh, the governor was kind of committed, but uh, we fortunately knew about that, and uh, uh, we didn't pick him. And well, What do you think about the current judicial appellate process, the, 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 the selection? Would you, would you like the appointment? Do you like the uh, contested Partisan elections? Would you like nonpartisan elections? Would you like uh, what? What system do you think best? Having been here now for 49 years doing this, there's no easy answer. Money has become the factor. You've been involved. You were spokesperson for the Supreme Court. You saw what they, what a political party they're trying to do. The radicals, the Koch brothers, and what they did, and uh, they're trying to pack the courts. You know, I don't care who's on the court. Just give me a fair shot. You may not like my issue, just let me argue my case. Don't treat me like a, you know, you know that I'm stupid. I mean, uh, but it really bothers me. We're in social media. I mean, you know, uh, this this matter, this unfortunate here in in uh, July 2000, 2015 is on this unfortunate killing of, of these Marines here in Chattanooga. Uh, I, I had a chance to be in that case. And I did turn it down. But I'm saying to you is that the news media is just making everything out of this. They took things that exaggerate, trying to make the story. That's why I don't like cameras in the courtroom. I think it, it turns judges uh, around. It makes lawyers want to think they're you know, trying for an Oscar. Uh, and it's just, you know, things are so different here. But I can't change it because it's, it sells. I mean, everything sells. And, and it's money has become an, a significant issue in the administration of justice. And money and justice, when you equate money with justice, justice loses. That's where it's always been. So at the University of Tennessee College of Law, there is now the Jerry H. Summers Advocacy Center. What's the purpose of that center? Is, how's that tie into the law school? Well, the main thing is to show a little appreciation the fact that they gave me a scholarship, and at least I got through one year and then was able to hang around when, and I believe John K. Morgan probably talked to the dean when my grades got down, and they probably could kick me out, and I always think John talked to him and said, he's a, maybe he can pull his mule out of the ditch if you give him another chance, and they did, 
And the law school, to, to me, I think you should, you go to the place, you, you, you thank the people that have helped you. And that's what I've felt like, I, that the people that helped me from my parents, my aunt and uncle, a guy at the glass factory named Charlie Sailors, we had Cheddar and Glass Company, they made Coca-Cola bottles, would give me jobs in the summertime. What did you do down there at Cheddar and Glass? I did everything. I, I, I was a seal-up boy, which means you put the, I, I was a kid that swept the floor. I drove a, bu, a, a what we call a bug. Uh, a, a, uh, I did everything. I worked in the decorating room, and, and uh, finally I'd been there so many years because uh, the guy was a central graduate, and he liked me, and I finally got to be in the laboratory. And I got to walk around in an air, after being in an air-conditioned room instead of being out there among those lays and those molds where it's about 120 degrees. I was in an air-conditioned room, and all I had to do was go around and pick up samples and cut them on a bandsaw, drop them in some acid. Well, it looks pretty good to me, so keep on making them. <laughs> you, you are known, and I don't want to embarrass you, but you are known to be a generous supporter of the University of the South and the University of Tennessee College of Law. Uh, is that because you think that you owe them something? Yes. What do you owe them? The opportunity that probably I did not take as good advantage of it as I should have. Uh, they gave me an opportunity. If I hadn't went to Swanee, I doubt if I'd got a scholarship to law school. I, I got a great education at uh, UT Law School. The only thing I did well in was moot court. Uh, but uh, I got that scholarship, and I, I owe something. And I believe that you pay back. And, and that's what I've tried to do in whatever way I've done that. Now, this may be a good place for us to take a break. So we'll be back momentarily. Jerry, it's now, you've been practicing now for 49 years. Tell us what your daily schedule is now. Is it the same as it was 49 years ago, or how is it different? No, it's changed a little bit. I, you don't sleep as well as we used to, and I wake up early. Uh, and I've been doing research. I've been doing some writing. And I try to do something before I go to court. Of course, I don't go to court every day like I used to. I've got good lawyers that cover a lot for me. But I do something I'm writing, whether I'm writing an article for a Sunday paper, dealing on something. I, last week, I wrote one on the Soapbox Derby in Chattanooga. And other things, most of them non-lawyer deals. Uh, and then I get up, I go to the office, and do a normal day. I, usually shoot pool at uh, lunch, uh, and then sometimes after uh, after work, I go over and shoot for about an hour with some buddies of mine, and that's it's changed that way. Your, your office that we're now uh, sitting in is about a half a block to the Mountain City Club. Is that where you play pool? That's where I play pool. Your interest in pool has really gotten big in the last five or six years. Actually, How did that come about? It was just something to do. I, uh, I've always played sports, and pool is a sport. And I started about uh, 10 years ago and, and started playing and progressed. And I'm now the best 74-year-old player in the club. Of course, I'm the only 74-year-old player in the club. <laughs> but uh, I play. We enjoy. We're a bunch of fellows. And it takes a little tension off of the pro problems of the day. Now, one of the questions I guess I need to ask you for people who are not familiar with the Mountain City Club, is it unusual to find a pool table in a businessman's club or not business person's club? The Mountain City Club's over 100 years old, and it's the, you know, it, it at one time it was the reputation of probably an elitist group, but it's become, we've got more and more ordinary folks in it now as times have changed, and I would like to think that maybe when they took me in that lowered the standards so maybe we've got a lot all included we, we've got women we have members of all faiths and all races and uh, it's a good place and it's close I can park there I'm within a block of my office and I spend a lot of time there okay got a few clients out of it too I might say okay so uh, what do you do for hobbies besides play pool well, I, I do a lot of reading. I do some writing. I, I've got a little cabin up on cabin up on the lake uh, that I go. Uh, it's Chickamauga Lake. Chickamauga Lake, up on a place called Possum Creek. I've had it since the 70s. Uh, I go out on it and try to spend the weekends up there. But uh, you know, it's still I still read the advance sheets. I still try to stay abreast of the law, and you know, and I hire good people. 
And I can tell you those good people make, a lot of somebody said something, they said, we believe you're getting smarter in your old age. I said, I am. I heard these people right here and they make me look good. I don't mean to ask you a question that will cause you to break the law or admit to violating the law, but do you play pool for money or not? Uh, that would be an incriminating question, but the stakes are such that usually uh, at a quarter game, I hope that we'll pass under the under the, uh, under the envelope of the uh, uh, IRS. <laughs> I usually lose as much as I gain and win, so maybe that's a good answer. Let me talk to you a little about some of your other activities besides practicing law. You're, you're involved in a number of civic uh, endeavors here in town. One of them is Special Olympics. Uh, what do you do there? How did you get involved? And, and to what extent is your involvement? Well, I got involved basically through a guy named John Popham, who is a, was the editor of the paper, Bill Castile, who wrote for the Chattanooga Times, and a politician, Flop Fuller, who I happened to stop in one day at a place on Main and Market called Pax Town Tavern. And they had good shrimp but it, and good beer. How many years ago were we speaking about? Oh, 25, I guess, 30, probably 30 years. Yeah. And they were talking to me uh, and brought up about Special Olympics. And I didn't really, wasn't involved in Special Olympics. And they said the guy was ahead of a fellow named Lord Ray Smith, had a van that broke down. He was having trouble getting these kids around to the, the events. And at that time, Lord Ray was at Orange Grove Center, which is the premier mental retardation, I think, close to being in the country. Uh, in the country of uh, and uh, right here in Chattanooga. Here in Chattanooga, he was a physical director, and that's that's uh, it has both residential and non-residential uh, places for people that have had dealt a bad break in life, and it's a wonderful place. And um, they, Lord Ray was the physical director at that time, and they asked me, uh, did I know anybody that could get him a van? Well, my uncle, who I loved, Jimmy Smith. Uh, was in the car business, and I said, well, I'll talk to somebody. They had, his van had broke down. He could have trouble getting these special people, clients around, so I went and talked to my uncle. And he said, well, I mean, you bring him out here in a couple of weeks, and I'll call you when we need to see him. So I told Lord Ray, we're seeing what we can do. Maybe we can get a good price. And I walked out. We went, he, my uncle called me. We went out there, and, and there's a 12-passenger van sitting out there. And it was used, a couple of years old. Uh, he's, he gave it to him, and you know it was a very emotional thing for Lord Ray. He was a paratrooper, but uh, he was he was a great bear, bear of a man. Lord Air Special Olympics, Air Force Special Olympics games are named after him now, and uh, that's how I got started. And then then somebody thought, well, maybe you will be on board at Orange Grove, Orange Grove Center, which is one of the premier facilities. And I think we now have 42 residences, uh, houses where these our clients can live and live a no, almost a normal life. And it's about, we handle probably between seven and 900 people that have, are, have mm -hmm. mental problems. And so I got involved and then uh, uh, they got me on the board of Orange Grove and uh, that's basically it. That's, I've been with them for about 30 some years now and it's, it's been a great uh, lesson to me and, you know, when you get kind of down, you lose a case, and you 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 kind of up, and you know you you. Uh, that's why I go to Special Olympics every spring, and you've been out there with me, you've helped me, and you you go out there and you say, can these people that have been dealt a bad break in life, if they can smile and have a big grin? A couple of years ago, you wrote a book about people who had helped you to attain whatever success you had made. I think it was called The Turtle on the Fence. Is that correct? Turtle and the Lawyer. Turtle and the Lawyer. What did you do with the proceeds from the sale of that book? Uh, it went to UT. I gave it the money. I didn't, what I did is I didn't handle the money. I gave uh, Central High School at the Community Foundation, agreed to monitor it. And if you want to buy a book from there, it would go to one of the scholarship programs that we've established at Central. We have 12 scholarships at Central High School, and that's unusual public school. And the other part of it went to the UT Law School, and then the third part of it went to Swanee, University of the South. And they handled the money, and, you know, I paid for it, and it was a way of kind of paying him back for kind of cleaning me up and maybe getting me a good start in life. <laughs> <laughs> You've got another book in the works. Tell us a little about that in advance of its publication, if you can. 
Well, it's about Judge Ralston Schofield, the last judge impeached in the state of Tennessee. And in 1958, it was the Tennessee version of the trial of the century. And he was a criminal court judge, very active politically. And he was, he got in some difficulty in the Tennessee bar and the local bar and establishment. He, they, they supported him to begin where, with. Where was he a judge? He was a judge in Hamilton County, in Chattanooga. He was a criminal judge. And uh, uh, they supported him to begin with, but he was kind of a renegade. He didn't do what they want, wanted him to do, I believe. And uh, he hung around with some wrong people. And so they decided to, time to get rid of him, and they impeached him. And he also ran against Governor <coughs> Frank Clement in 1954. Uh, and Gordon, Bra uh, Gordon Browning, and he ran on a segregationist ticket. And uh, that didn't endear him because he, he pretty well jumped all over uh, the other candidates. He didn't get but about 30,000 votes, but um, he developed a lifelong enemy in, in, uh, with Frank Clement. And that's a real big theme of the story because the trial that he had, it was the last trial of impeachment in the uh, Tennessee General Assembly, where the House sitting as a grand jury indicted him, and they uh, then the uh, Senate up and tried him on 24 counts, and he was acquitted on all but three of them, which were very minor charges, and it involved some interesting people. Bobby Kennedy is in, in, in it, uh, Senator McClellan, uh, John Siegenthaler. Uh, it, it, it's, a fa it's a fascinating story, and it's it, it only covers his life when he started. He was either born in 1905 or 1906, nobody knows for sure, up through 1958 when he was impeached. But there's enough material from 1958 when he got disbarred, led by the Chattanooga and Tennessee Bar Association, until he died in 1982 because he had a resurrection. He got elected to public office. He got he got elected as a judge, General Sessions judge in '74. And there's a lot of additional stories that, if I live long enough, or hopefully somebody, uh, will tell that story because it was quite a story. How did you get interested in writing about him? I, I didn't know him that well when he was on the Sessions bench from '74 to '82. Uh, I, I, most of the criminal cases were down in city court at that time, uh, and I didn't know him very well. I got to be a good friend. I am a good friend. I'm proud to be a good friend of his son, Carter. Uh, but I always heard stories about him, and I always heard about the trial. I was a junior in high school when he was impeached in 58. Uh, and I didn't, and I started looking into it. And there's a wealth of information in the Chattanooga Bicentennial Library. Uh, one lady has got a, a folder that covered both the local and all the state papers about his trial. And it's fascinating. And uh, I just got interested in it. And I thought, this was Tennessee's trial of the century in 1958. And I said, somebody needs to tell something about it. And I don't know why it never had. So I just started fooling into it, and it's turned into a monster. I finally got it to go to a publisher. It's got a little 400 pages plus about a 120 pages in the appendix because there's certain things, the legal documents I felt ought to tell more of the story. And then I've got about 75 pictures of, of that. And hopefully it'll sell more than two copies. So you found a new hobby as you're getting late in your career. I've been, I, I, I wrote for the paper when I was at Swanee and, uh, and a sports editor because I, I was captain of the baseball team, co-captain of the baseball team, and Coach Majors kind of took a liking to me. And so I got to write for go on. I was a statistician for the football team because I was co-captain of the baseball team. And I, I wrote some articles for the paper and up there in the annual and so forth. And I, I'm, I, I just wished I'd spent more time uh, what do you say, honing those those talents. But uh, I, I did get paid. I'd write for the Chattanooga Times and the Free Press about Swanee Beat, Millsaps, yeah. and so forth, things like that. So, But I hadn't done it, hadn't had time. But I've, lately, I've got good people, and so I've started writing. I write a column for the paper on occasion. Uh, last two weeks ago here in July, we had an article about the Soapbox Derby and its history in Chattanooga. And something to do. You talked about Ralston Schoolfield being the last person impeached uh, here in Tennessee. Uh, let me talk to you a little about the last person who was prosecuted for, for disbarment before Rule, we called it then Rule 42, but the Board of Professional Responsibility. You and I were both involved in that. Uh, tell us a little about that. Well, 
before the Board of Professional Responsibility, complaints against lawyers were often handled by local uh, local bar association, they what they call them special masters, I think. And they were supposed to be members of the respective members of the bar that would hear complaints about things. And back in those days there was a lot of a lot of complaints about what we call law uh, ambulance chasing or piking lawsuits on one lawyer stealing another lawyer's client. And uh, they and also it got up to the point there was a lawyer here that uh, had connections with an insurance company. And he either earned the right to represent that insurance company, or he piped that away. Uh, in fact, he had a brother-in-law that was the head of that of that insurance company's claims office. Uh, Might have had something to do with it. And uh, the, the the establishment lawyers, who had been representing this company for many many years, got upset and they brought charges against him. And in the last that I know of case of this type, you and I got appointed to be the prosecutors in that case. And uh, uh, you got into it first, and then I, in a weak moment I agreed to, to, go, to handle it with you. And it was not a very pleasant experience. And But I think we tried it. Uh, we tried it fairly. We offered the uh, lawyer a, a, a reduced settlement. He wouldn't take it, and, and he got disbarred, and probably made more money but, uh, when he got back because the insurance company knew that he fought for him, and that's it. But that was my experience with that and it was not a very pleasant experience. I remember, my memory may be dim too, but I think it was about 1974 and the, it was then called the Rule, Rule 42 which established Board of Professional Responsibility and Lance Bracey had just been appointed to be the charge of that office and we asked him if he would take this case and you remember what he said? I don't remember. You tell me, but uh, I, what he, he said was, "Well, you go ahead and finish it up. I'm starting new stuff." And, so, <laughs> and who do we try it to? Do you remember? We said it was tried. How was it tried? We tried it before a judge, a retired judge from West Tennessee. No, from I, Nashville. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, we tried it in Chancery Court. The late Jim Lee, who has just died day before last night, yeah. uh, was was representing the lawyer. And another and, lawyer from Nashville, Reverend Tyree Harris, represented him too. Your memory's better than mine. Well, it was both getting dim. <laughs> but the lawyer was, was suspended for a year, and we had offered him three months suspension, and he didn't take it. I thought we'd offered him a, uh, that he, we offered him a year, and he got two years. Now that's, you know, you're well, right. Well, boy, I remember it. Made, but was that a pleasant experience for you? It wasn't no, for me. It, it, was, it made me feel like I was a hit man. And you and I tried every way in the world to try and resolve that matter. And and Jim Lee was a, I, I've gone to know Jim Lee's a good guy, but he's kind of opinionated. He he, he was hard to deal with in any kind of litigation. And uh, actually it turned out well because the lawyer eventually came back and was stronger than ever, I think. And But it, it was something that I do not cherish in my legal history. What's your view, if you have one now, about how the Board of Professional Responsibility is operating today? Is, is it good or need improvement? Do I get immunity with my answers in there? <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the problem with anything in this day and age is a bureaucracy starts at this size and it expands and there is pressure to, like a prosecution, there's pressure that you've got to do something and it sometimes it gets off just the facts and the circumstances. That's my big problem with any type of agency, not just the Board of Professional Responsibility. I, uh, Lance Bracey was there, uh, you know, it was a lot, a lot less formal than it is now. The, uh, I've had very limited dealings with them, but uh, it, it's just this whole thing, a creation of bureaucracies to handle every problem is something that I think we're, we've gone, ast gone astray. You changed the subject. Back in 1994, I think maybe you, you applied or wanted to be considered to be the, the appointment of uh, the president to the new federal district judge here in, in Chattanooga. Do you recall that? Yes, and thank goodness I didn't get it. <laughs> Tell me what, what was the occasion for the vacancy and what made you decide you wanted to be considered for that appointment? Well, I think it's the same vacancy that you applied for, but it was under a different administration. Democrats were in power and uh, under the Clinton administration, and I had been active for Clinton, this for all his hidden secrets came out, I might point out, but I had been for him early on and uh, he got elected and myself and Roger Dixon 
and Charlie Gerheiser, all Chattanooga lawyers. Charlie's now deceased, been president of the Tennessee Bar. Uh, we were going to meet and, hey, uh, to try to see, get somebody to run for the office, uh, to appointment, because uh, it was open, it's still been open, untimely death, I believe, of Judge Wilson. Uh, I, I, if I interrupt you, that, that, that office was created, that judgeship was created in October of 1990, mm -hmm. and it wasn't filled until 1995. Right. Well, it, uh, it's, there was some controversy, uh, but uh, I was trying to get Roger Dixon, who, had been a, who was a federal magistrate, who's now a senior partner at Miller & Martin, uh, or Charlie Gerheiser, who'd been president of the Tennessee Bar, the Chattanooga Bar, and Roger had just left his old firm, I think it was Baker Donaldson, and had gone to Miller & Martin, and had been received a substantial pay raise. Charlie didn't really want it. Uh, he, he said, well, I don't have the personality for it. Charlie was a great guy. He's now deceased and a wonderful fellow. Uh, and they said, why don't you try it? I said, you crazy? They said, oh, you've got all the experience. You've got personal, uh, uh, you got personal injury experience. You've got criminal experience. You've been a prosecutor. You can do a wonderful job. And they played on my ego a little bit, you know. And like a fool, I, I went for it and I put my name in. But I thought, well, I, I won't last, uh, you know, I'm representing labor unions. I won't get past the first. But S Senator Sasser, whom I think played it, milked it for all he could, trying to get reelected, but we know he didn't. Uh, he put it out and he, we had these interviews. I think there was about 18 people or something that were invited to come to Nashville to be interviewed. And I remember driving through the snow to get there at the old federal building. And um, for some reason of the 18 people, the three that were picked were myself, uh, Mike Calloway, a, a fine lawyer from Cleveland, and Judge Curt and Curtis Collier, who's an assistant uh, uh, United States attorney. And we were the ones that got invited to go to Washington. <coughs> And Sasser, I think, did a great job of politicking it all the way through. He covered every base. Or given. But there were some good people in there. Chink Brown, Judge Chink Brown was in there, and uh, How, Chancellor How Peoples from here, as well as many other lawyers in the area. Uh, but we went up there and were interviewed, and then, of course, Judge Collier got the job, and I have personally reminded of him of the economic uh, uh, difference in our uh, st difference in our economic status as a result of him getting that job, particularly in light of federal judges' pay raises being frozen. If you had gotten that appointment, do you think you would have liked it? Be a completely different type of work. You know, I thought about how I would have had an induction ceremony, and I was president of the Chattanooga Bar. Uh, when a certain federal judge got <laughs> got, got uh, installed, and it was to me, it was offensive. It was, June 24, 1983. Well, I was going way I was going to do it is I was going to put these people that are in my book, my parents, my aunt and uncle who like a set set of parents, the other people who helped me, and I was going to put them over in that jury box, and I was basically going to say thank you. I've got this job instead of all this posterior pucking that we as lawyers go through. And, and it was, a, I think you and I actually saw a, a copy of a film that had the Chariots of Fire soundtrack in the background. Uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, and that's fine. That's, if that's what you want to be judged, you can do what you want to. But I, I just, uh, there would not, uh, it would have been a different world down there and probably I'd have got impeached in about the first uh, year because I'd have declared those federal sentencing guidelines probably unconstitutional. They're horrible, but I didn't get the job so we don't have to deal with that problem. But What's wrong with the federal sentencing guidelines? The president has announced that we need some criminal, criminal reforms. What's your view and what did we need? I think that they were, uh, that th they put the emphasis at that time, it was all on drugs. Uh, now we've got, uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with what happened. The idea was to prosecute drug dealers, but what it's done is that many times it gets down. And you're dealing with very minor drug dealers, uh, and the punish the the uh, the sentences are almost uh, draconian, and. Uh, and the, the, the Fed, U.S. Supreme Court, without declaring those sentencing guidelines unconstitutional, they have whittled them down in many, many ways since they were initially uh, adopted in, in several years ago. Should the judges have discretion in sentencing? They've got more now than they did. 
And does that result in sentencing disparities? Well, that was the idea of, the, of uh, I'll never forget this, and I told you this, that uh, there was a speaker, and I think the time we went down to St. Petersburg together, uh, to visit, you went to visit your dad, and I went to sentencing, federal sentencing guidelines, and there was a judge on there uh, from, the ni from the Fifth Circuit, and I think he's still there, he's about 90 years old, and he, he talked about the federal sentencing guidelines. And he said something that, uh, in regard to uh, those guidelines, had come about as a result of a compromise between Ted Kennedy and Strom Thurmond. And he said, and I will tell you that anything that's a compromise between Strom Thurmond and Ted Kennedy is a bastard. <laughs> and that's why he decided the federal sentencing guidelines, and I think to a certain degree uh, uh, it's true, but uh, it's. It, that's Congress. Congress, we, you know, Congress does what Congress wants to do. You played sports in, in high school and college. I'm changing the subject again, but do you still follow sports? I do. Who are your favorite teams? Which are your favorite teams? Well, I've always St. Louis Cardinal fan. That was when I lived in St. Petersburg. Uh, I used to play on the ball field where the Yankees trained. Uh, I did a commercial with Yogi Berra in the eighth grade. Uh, and, and baseball's always been my sport. I played football and I played basketball, but uh, baseball, I, I still, and I watch the Braves, you know, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm an amateur manager. I, I think, you know, what they're doing now with the kind of ball team they have, they could do a lot better than trying to swing for the fences, but, you know, they, uh, it, it, it's just like everything else, I'm out of, out of date. You know, I found out the other day that in minor league baseball now, you have 20 seconds between pitches to speed the game along. Well, that, they speed it up in, in major league, too. That, 20 that, second rule? I, I don't know if it's 20 seconds. It's, uh, you also sit on the board of the, the, what do they call it, the Finley Stadium Corporation. Tell us a little about what that is and what you do. Well, Finley Stadium Corporation, it's actually the Stadium Corporation, was created to build a football stadium off of the UTC campus, and I was selected as the legislative delegate. And there was about nine of us. It was under the initial leadership of a gentleman named Gordon Davenport. And Gordon is a his family founded the Crystal Company. And we, we erected Finley Stadium, and we've been through the ups and downs of Finley Stadium. There's, uh, there's you know, it's, it, but it's a great facility. They're going to have this uh, game with the women's soccer team uh, in, in a few weeks. It's a big event, and it's UTC Stadium. We've now got a good football team. We've had some lean years. Uh, we've got a great creative uh, manager down there now that's trying to get some outdoor concerts, and it's been something that's, it, it's been frustrating at times. Times, but it's something I've enjoyed. You talked earlier about the, and I'm, I'm not very organized, but let me just ask you some backtracking questions. You talked earlier about how the practice of law or the, the study of law is not what it should be. Uh, what changes has the Jerry Summers Advocacy Center made or attempted to make in legal education? Well, I, I hope that they are you know, just former Justice Penny White is the head of it, and, and I hope that they're teaching people how to be lawyers. Uh, they're modernized. There's things now that you and I never dealt with. Uh, we we were still at coming transfer into electric typewriters. Maybe when we started and uh, the computers, the research, the all these things, uh, the way cases are tried. You know, the way you have to. Uh, you know, everybody knows everything. The news media is so much more competitive. It's an entirely different. I mean, I hate to say it, uh, Your Honor, but you and I are dinosaurs. Uh, everything has changed entirely from when we started a long, long time ago. Can you do legal research on a computer? Barely. I know I can do it. I, I, I can do it. In fact, I do a lot of research. The, the research for these articles that I write yeah. for the paper and so forth, uh, it's amazing what you can do. You go, you punch in the magic word and they'll give you something you can go back and forth. It, it's so much easier than we had to get one of these books and find one and then go back about another 20 years to find another decision. It, it's so much easier. Everything is universal. Well, we hear a lot today about civility in the practice of law, not what it once was. What's your view about lawyers getting along with each other now as compared to 1966? Well, it, this is, I'm not the originator of this idea that lawyers are less civil. Um, 
but they used to fight in the courtroom back in our days. If you if you fight in the courtroom now, you're going you're gonna to get before the Board of Professional Responsibility. Uh, I mean, the stories of, in my research in this Schofield book about some of the people that would fight, actually fight in the courtroom, it's over with. And now, physically fight? Huh? Physically fight, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, it was, uh, you'll have to read the book, but uh, there's a... Uh, uh, but they weren't doing that in 1966 when we began, were they? No, they were just cussing then. <laughs> they, they wouldn't actually fight uh, too much, but uh, it, it was, uh, you know, there wasn't as many lawyers. There's probably three or four hundred. We've got, what, twelve hundred now, and uh, you've got the billable hours problem, and you've got the cost of running a law office. I had an office up in the old, when I left the DA's office at the old professional building, which is just a park next to the Memorial yeah. Auditorium. And I paid two hundred fifty dollars a month that include all the utilities, and I had a part-time secretary, and uh, you know, it, it was it, it was not that expensive. Now you've got the expense is just tremendous, and these bigger firms they keep to get more and more mega firms, and they have to their expenses. They have these associates that have got to justify about all these billable hours and so forth, and it, it's just and there's just. Uh, it's just gotten too complex and too fast maybe for an old timer, but it's still a lot of fun. You've always been a, a sole practitioner, and then you've had some lawyers that have been associates. Uh, you've never had a partner. Can you tell us why? Well, when you split, it, uh, it's kind of like a marriage. If you split, you got to divide up all the assets. If you don't have no partners, you don't have to divide up. You just up and say, thank you, goodbye. Uh, and, and my lawyers have been with me. The ones, the late, late the ones with me the longest had just been appointed a administrative law judge, Tom Wyatt Jr. in the uh, in the field of workers' compensation. Uh, Jeff Ruflo, a graduate of UTC and U UTK, and and Jimmy Rogers have been with me uh, uh, many many years. I'm trying to remember over 20, close to 30. Oh, yeah. So so I try to make it comfortable. If, if you remember, I offered you an opportunity to go in with me one time, but you wisely chose another path to come on Tennessee Supreme Court. But uh, I've always tried to treat my lawyers well. They, they work hard, and if they are, they're rewarded. Now, and we don't have any, if they want to leave, uh, you know, we've got one lawyer now that's up for consideration for a criminal court here in, in Chattanooga. Um, you and I had him as students uh, at UTC and as special instructors. Um, and, you know, when they want to leave, they just up and leave. And I've never had those arguments, well, I owe 20% of that cup or something like that. And it's, that, that may not work for everybody else, but it's worked pretty well for me, and they stay with me. Tom White was with me over 30-something years, and Jeff Buffalo and Jimmy Rogers uh, have mm -hmm. been with me a long time, so I try to take care of my lawyers. Do you have any plans to retire? That's a good question. Uh, I enjoy what I do. I'm involved in some couple controversies now that people say, why is that old fool uh, taking on the TBI? Why did he take on the TWRA and things? And, and I, my rule is very simple this, Mickey. I, I don't have a real smart brain, but I got a good gut. And if something in my gut just don't feel right, then I think somebody ought to attack it. And I'm fortunate in the stage of life that I can up and do that. It's not about the money. It's about the ideas that um, that there's things that just aren't right, and somebody needs to raise it. And if you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. You mentioned current controversy involving the TW, T, TBI, is that it, and the TWRA? Tell us who, what those, what those organizations are and what the controversy well, is about. Well, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, that one is basically over. I think I, I think I got thrown under the bus by the appellate courts, but that's okay. That was where uh, certain judges in certain courts were getting all the cases instead of them being equally distributed and for political reasons. And uh, I, uh, I had a special judge, the Honorable... Oh, what's his name? He's such a special judge many times, and he's a wonderful fellow. Kerry Blackwood. Kerry Blackwood. Who's stepping down again, yeah, finally. Yeah, he's stepping down, and he is. He heard that, and he came, and he ruled for me every way except the last point. He said, well, you had one little gap there, he said. And so he, he sent it back, but we he ruled, he ruled in my favor, but not completely. And we appealed it, and, <laughs> and the appellate courts overruled him and me. And I... I felt we were right because judges aren't supposed to get 98% of the cases. And uh, Did you have any fear that that might upset these judges that you were challenging? 
that bother you at all? They're going to get paid. They still don't get to wear their robe. I treat them with respect. I treat judges I, that I don't have any respect for. I treat them with respect. And that's what you're supposed to do. And you may not discriminate. As long as they give me a right to make my record and allow me to appeal, they will be treated with respect with me. And even if they don't, I'll respectfully note an exception. And it's hard to put, get hard for them to put your butt in jail if you treat them that way. And I've never been put in jail, never been fined. Uh, I treat, I respect the judiciary. I may not always respect the person that's wearing the robe, but I respect that robe and that and the judiciary. And you've, I think I did that in a few cases. I was lucky enough to argue before you. Hopefully. <laughs> what about this case with the TBI? What's that issue about the current current dispute you're handling? Well, it's primarily involving DUIs, which is a very hot topic in this state because. Uh, Basically, the question is, is this, that the TBI, uh, they use their, uh, if they can, uh, if, if you're charged with DUI and their lab gets a, uh, a does the test, and if they up and, con and they convict you, that lab gets a fee, $350, uh, $250 up to $350. And the TBI, uh, in the last several years, has gotten close to over $10 million. For these fees, if they and basically, I argued that they are up and helping convict people, and they're not supposed to be there. A laboratory is supposed to be a neutral uh, person. Now, I've uh, I've had it before a three judge panel here. Uh, they overruled me as I expected them to do, but they gave me a great hearing, and we're now in the court of criminal appeals, and uh, uh, they they up and. Uh, they don't, nobody wants to ha deal with this issue because down, you know, it's really the question is where the defendant's getting a fair trial. Uh, the only issue there is the fact is, is, is that one question. Is that, does that violate due process of law? It is the fact that they up and uh, they get the money for helping convict you? And I will probably go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. They may not grant it, but I feel very strongly about it. You said a three-judge panel. Are you talking about at the trial court level? I got a three-judge panel. How did that happen? I, I moved for them to in bank, uh, because, in bank because of the fact That's the that three, three local criminal three, three local criminal judges, and they gave me a great hearing. And since they've now found out some other things, I'd like to have another hearing for them. But uh, it, it's too late. The record's there. Uh, we didn't have the 10.8 million dollars that they've gotten uh, for on this fee, uh, and. Uh, but they, you know, they gave me a great hearing, and the, the Court of Criminal Appeals, you know, I better be careful what I say, but the Court of Criminal Appeals, I don't think they really want this decision. We did a, ask for an interlocutory appeal. The trial judges gave it to us, and we're up there, and uh, they have denied my interlocutory appeal uh, and said, that even though they made some interesting comments on there that this is an unusual situation or something like that. So we, you know, we're going up to Tennessee Supreme Court. If they deny it, it's very narrowly drawn. It's only on the constitutionality of this statute that allows them to get a, the fee when they do the blood test or the breath test. If you lose in front of the Tennessee Supreme Court, would you consider going to the U.S. Supreme Court case? That's what I'm planning to do. And this is a good question, but maybe you don't answer. Does your client have the kind of money to pay for that? Of course not. So you're doing that pro bono? Well, I've asked them if they'll contribute, but if they don't, I'm still going. I, I have, I've had to, every time I've been in the U.S. Supreme Court, I had to pay my way up there. There's some things that you just believe in. You got to stick your noose, head in the noose, whether either you're going to get choked or you get out. <laughs> All right. I think it's an interesting issue that on the question yeah. the appearance of justice that you shouldn't have, to, you know, th there should not be a monetary, when you, when you mix justice with money, Mickey, excuse me, Mr. Justice, when you mix met justice with money, justice loses. You like to read a lot. What, what are you currently reading? The changing the subject again. Well, I do read a lot. I read everything from fiction, nonfiction, uh, I, I belong to the Notable Trial Situation uh, book. Uh, I've just read a book and I've written an article in the paper about uh, uh, Lord Haw Haw. I don't know if you remember who Lord Haw Haw no. was. No. Well, I'll tell you. Lord Haw Haw was the equivalent of uh, Tokyo Rose. Is that yeah. most people recognize Tokyo Rose? Axis Th Sally. Th she was the Japanese, and Lord Haw Haw was the fellow that uh, wrote for was for Germany. And they were the ones that were the announcers that spread all this propaganda over the air during World War II. And they, uh, 
they spoke, and uh, it was kind of interesting about their stories. And I've written an article for the local paper. How do you spell Lord Ha Ha? Lord, well, that's not his real name, and, and his uh, his real name was William Joyce, J O Y C E. But he, the way he talked in his English brogue, that they kind of he laughed. They called him Lord. His nickname of the soldiers in Europe, were, and particularly the soldiers that were stationed in in England prior to D Day that he spread this propaganda about how it's going to happen to you when you try to invade Normandy, where you've been. I know what you, the, yeah. what the place, you know, I know what the place looks like because you've told me. But basically, uh, th that's Lord Haw Haw, William Joyce, and he got tried for treason after the war, as did Tokyo Rose, who was Japanese, and she broadcast for the Japanese. And I'll leave it to the another day uh, because they both were wound up in different ways as far as how they were treated. Lord Haw Haw was tried by the tried by the British, and Tokyo Rose was tried by the Americans, and uh, their endings are quite different. Did they get fair trials? You know, Lord Haw Haw got a fair trial. It surprised me the British system how colloquial it was. Lord Haw Haw got a fair trial, and then he got hung. Tokyo Rose, I don't know about her getting a fair trial, but she got turned loose. I mean, she didn't get, not completely, but she was ultimately, uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Carter pardoned her eventually. She got something like five years, but they're fascinating historical stories, and I read those. I like to read about old trials and so forth and things of that nature, so that's part of what I read. I, I still read advance sheets, uh, you know, and I read things that... I've seen you read an advance sheet while you're driving. Um... Uh, I'm, I get, you know, I'm not in too good stead with the highway patrol right now. But a couple of you don't text and drive now, do you? Huh? You don't text and no, drive. No, I don't text and drive. But I, but I occasionally, if, uh, if it's on the freeway, and I, I got something, I'll flip the pages. I'm a, Judge Frank Wilson used to do that, I understand. So that put me in the only time I could equate myself with him. But he was the federal judge that we all honor and respect and revere. <laughs> Anything else you want to tell us that I haven't asked you? Let me ask one question. Who's the best lawyer you ever saw in a courtroom, excluding yourself? Well, <laughs> excluding myself, that leaves a wide range. I will tell you who the best lawyer on his feet was. Who? And he doesn't practice law anymore. And he's Ralston Schofield's son. His name was Carter Schofield. Yeah. And uh, he's in the boat business now. But he, when I was a prosecutor, I dealt with him. And I would be up all night trying to study and get ready, and he would come in. And this was the old days. He couldn't get by with it now. But he would borrow a piece of paper. He'd say, can we settle this case? And I'd give him an offer, and then he'd say, well, I guess we better try it. Will you loan me a piece of paper and a pencil? And he would get before the jury and just mesmerize them. He had that great natural talent. Yeah. And, you know, but he, he, he wasn't the best organized. He, you know, he did things that would be acceptable today. And I don't mean unethical. I'm just saying no. about not being organized and so forth. But he had that natural talent. And I tried to get him to go in with me at, at some point. And I said, listen, between the two of us, I'll organize them and you and I will try them. And we tried several cases in that capacity and did very well. But he was a great, he was a great lawyer from the old days. Is, a, days is a great trial lawyer born or trained? I think a little bit of both. I think you have to, you have to, you know, you have to know what you're doing, uh, but you got to have a certain ability to deal with people. Some of the greatest technicians are the lousiest lawyers. You got to get get people to like you, you know, or not hate you. And, you know, and you if you got on a, you know, you walk into the courtroom now with all these cameras, uh, everything is televised and. You know, everybody knows everything about it. You know, I mean, lawyers have up and got the jury panel, and they've tried to go on Google and all this and all that, Facebook, and find out what you can, you know, who you corresponding with, who you're writing um, letters to, and so forth. And, and everything is more open. But the thing about it is, see, you, know, well, you look at, you know, Fox, Fox News or CNN, you know, everybody's got an opinion. This unfortunate case we're talking about where this fellow went into the, the uh, recruiting station here and killed his people in, in Chattanooga. That's, I mean, th there's so much news on that. And there's, you know, what's the real truth sometimes comes out and sometimes it doesn't. 
you're an old line Democrat here in a conservative community. How do you get along? Well, all my friends are Republicans, just about. There's not many, but I, that's that's hereditary. My daddy plowed behind a mule, barefoot, over in Henry County in McKenzie, Paris, and you know I'm, I don't have a political party. I could fit. I could probably be federal. Well, maybe. If, well, you didn't get it. And you was a Republican, but I might have. When you used to be a Democrat, you remember those days? But, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I don't have a really a party, uh, even though I'm still a lawyer for the election committee. Not the lawyer. I'm a member. For, I was a lawyer for the election commission as a Democrat. Now I'm a, a member of the election commission. But I'm. I'm. When it comes to individual rights, I'm liberal. Uh, and when it comes to fiscal policy, I'm probably conservative. So I really don't fit either place, uh, but I, you know, politics is something that we as lawyers need to be involved in. Uh, but I just, th there's the old line politicians uh, to me are gone. I mean, everybody, you know, stick their finger up in the wind, see which way it's blowing. That's the way I'm going to vote for it. Uh, I'd have been, in, I've never been much in politics, even though I've been involved in it. One last subject matter that I just completely forgot, but we can't end this interview without me talking about. You've had a judicial career, haven't you? Oh yes. Tell us about that. Well, I was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Saudi Daisy, and I got peach, impeached. For those who don't know, what is Saudi Daisy? Saudi Daisy is a two, is a little community up in uh, north of the, uh, Northampton County. It's Canyons, incorporated but, town. It's incorporated town, and and the people couldn't get along enough to pick one name, so they just named it Saudi Daisy. Some people wanted to be named Saudi, and other one named be Daisy. Daisy's named after a, a lady, and I don't know where Saudi came from. But I've had clients up there for over years, and you did when you used to practice law. Uh, it's quite an unusual, very independent. Uh, People and the first judgeship, they they when they were getting ready to annex everybody, Cy Daisy became incorporated, and they hired me as the first judge, and I think I made the luxurious sum of two hundred fifty dollars a month, going up there twice a month, and it rocked along, and everything was fine until a local judge down here got criticized by a group called Mad, uh, not Mad, Mothers Against Drunk, uh, yeah, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, but that was some other name they had, and. Uh, uh, the session judge says, "Why are you complaining about us? Jerry Summers turns these DUIs loose up there inside Day. So they got on me, and uh, were you turning them loose? I was making adjustments so a family, of, a father of five, uh, could support his family. But I made it in a way that I helped them. But if they ever came back, they knew I was going to barbecue them. And if anybody did come out, they didn't get no 48 hours. They got something like 45 days. I never treated a second, of, uh, a first offense that I had reduced." As a first offense, I'm, and and we didn't have, we eliminated some of the problems, but it also saved some people. People had families they had to feed, so and I, I was wrong. I mean, I guess I was looking back now, and uh, but I anyway, uh, they fired me first time. They got three Republicans on the council up there, and uh, when they, was this? Now we're talking about. Oh God, I think it's back in the 70s, 80s. Yeah, I think so, and. and uh, and so all the people that loved me or supported me, you got to sue them. I mean, everything in Saudi Daisy is always divided. Were right you down appointed there. or elected? I was appointed, and that's what we changed. The judges now in, in municipal courts are now elected, and it's mainly because of a case called Summers v. Thompson. And I didn't win it, but uh, I lost it. And there's another story behind that politically. But uh, it was a three to two vote. It's the only case I think in the history of the juris. juris Prudence of the state of Tennessee. Frank DeWota wrote two opinions. He wrote the majority opinion saying they could fire me. Uh, but uh, there was, we had a big hearing, and then he wrote he wrote a dissenting opinion. Now I, I don't know you sat on on the Court of Criminal Appeals and on the Tennessee Supreme Court, but did you ever write two opinions in the same case? Well, I'm not answering the questions today, but let me ask you this question. <laughs> you say. You say the case was called Summers v. Thompson. Tell us who the Summers was and who the Thompson was. Well, it was what Judge, the issue Judge was. Summers and Thompson was the mayor of Saudi Daisy, and they they four to one vote. And one of your clients was absent, the Honorable Jimmy Williamson. He decided not to appear, and they they fired me. And and uh, I had all this pressure. Well, take them to court because they didn't know what the law was. And 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 I said, well, I tell you what I'll do. If y'all can get 3,500 named on a petition, which they didn't have, but about 3,000 registered voters up there. I said, I'll sue them. 
Well, they showed up with a petition with about 4,500 names on it, and there I'm stuck. So, I, but then you know, they had everybody. I think some animals may have actually signed that petition. But anyway, they they got me then. So I had to sue them, and we sued them, and it, it's it's changed the law. It's something I'm really proud of, even though I got fired, because I think that elected judges are more responsible in these lower courts. Which opinion did you like better from Justice Trotter, the first one or the second one? Do what? <laughs> Which opinion did you like best from Justice Roe, the first one or the second one? Well, I would like the, the I like the second, the minority opinion that Roe to well, It was three to two because that way I'd pledged I was going to give the money to Orange Grove Center that, and for my back pay, and I didn't get that. So that that would have been the who would help the most is the kids and clients at Orange Grove Center. <laughs> I think that's about all I'm going to ask you today. Great job, thank you. Thank you, Mickey. I appreciate it, and I appreciate our friendship.